Welcome to Data Demystified. I'm Jeff Gallick, and this is my series of tutorial videos on how to use SPSS to work with data. In this video, I'm going to show you how to conduct and interpret a k-means cluster analysis. As always, we'll be using the YouTube viewing habits survey that I created, and you could find both a link to the data file and a video tutorial of the data below. In a previous video, I actually talk about hierarchical cluster analysis and describe how we can use the results of that via a dendrogram to determine the number of clusters to actually use in our k-means cluster analysis, which is what we'll talk about here. If you haven't seen that video, I suggest stopping here and actually watching that first. In any case, a k-means cluster analysis is going to do the clustering for us, assign cluster membership to the individuals based on the algorithm, as well as describe those clusters on the dimensions that we're actually creating the clustering on. So to do all of that, it's pretty straightforward. We go up to Analyze, Classify, K means cluster analysis. Now there's a few things that we're gonna do. So for this analysis, we're actually gonna use these importance measures. They're right here. It's the same ones that we use for the hierarchical analysis video. We're gonna include them in our variables. And note right here, we have to define the number of clusters. Now I'm gonna leave that as two because that was the conclusion from our hierarchical cluster analysis that two made the most sense. But of course, in your case, you should change this to whatever is appropriate. There's one silly little thing we have to do under iterate. K-means is an iterative algorithm, meaning that it runs until there's a convergent solution. And for whatever reason, there's a default in SPSS that says stop after 10 iterations. Well, that's fine for some cases, but in many, many cases, it takes more than 10 iterations to converge. And if you don't change this default, you're actually going to get stuck with an incorrect answer. So one of the easiest things we could do is just make this as big as possible and make it something like 99. To be clear, if the algorithm converges sooner, it'll stop running anyway, so this doesn't really change much at all. So we click Continue. Under save, we're gonna ask this algorithm to save the cluster membership as well as the distance from cluster centers, and I'll show you what that is in just a moment. And then finally, under options, we're gonna select the ANOVA table, and we'll see what that does for us as well. And now we'll click continue, and then we can click okay. So we get quite a few things here, and I'll walk through all of them for you. So the first thing we get is this initial cluster centers, and actually, we don't care about this at all. This is where the algorithm starts, but we wanna know where the algorithm finishes, and that's gonna be later on. We see in our iteration history that it actually took 14 iterations to converge. So if we had set that default to 10, our algorithm would have stopped prematurely and we would have had an incorrect result. But since we changed that default, we're fine. Here is the table that we'll spend most of our focus on. But before we get to that, let me scroll down a little bit more first. This is our ANOVA table. This table allows us to say whether these variables that we've included in our model actually help us discriminate across the different clusters. And the way we do that is we look here for our significance level. And if we see that one of those values is not statistically significant, then we conclude that there's no difference between any of the clusters on that particular variable. Now, that's not the case here. In every instance, these variables were useful in determining the different cluster memberships. But you could imagine a case where, let's say, these two numbers are the same, and they're not statistically differentiable. That would tell us that this variable right here was not useful in splitting these two clusters. And that just is what it is. In our case, like I said, they're all going to be different, and so we'll look at all of them in just a moment. The last thing to notice is down here. This tells you the size of each of your clusters. So in this case, cluster 1 represented 344 individuals, and cluster 2 represented a much larger group, 656 individuals. And of course, if you had more clusters, this table would be more robust. So now let's go back up to that main table right here, final cluster centers. SPSS has rounded this to the nearest whole number because that's the way that I had actually defined those variables, but that makes it really hard for us to see what's going on. So I'm going to change that. And one of the easiest way to do that is to double click into this, select all of our cells, right click and hit cell properties. We see this window open up and down here it says decimals. And I'm just going to set that to two decimals. And you'll see that once I hit apply, that automatically changes those to not round to the nearest whole number, but rather to round to the second significant digit. So we can click OK, and this is a lot easier for us to interpret. Now, what these are are the averages for that variable for the individuals who happen to have been placed in that cluster. So on this dimension, who is the content creator? How important is that in determining whether people watch a video? The average value for all the people in cluster 1 is 3.55, and the average value for all the people in cluster 2 is 2.62. And those are significantly different from one another. I know that because down here, our ANOVA table for the same variable says that that is a statistically significant difference. And so if I were to interpret this table, what I would do is I'd systematically go through every one of these variables 
and I'd see how they differ. So for instance, what was the video about? Now that is a significant, but only slightly so difference. So there's really not much going on there, right? These two clusters don't differ too much on that dimension. If we go on to the next one, the quality of the video production, well, it seems like cluster one again cares about that a whole lot more. And in fact, if you kind of glance at all of these, it looks like cluster one is just much more discerning. And one way we can make that a little bit easier to see is if we double click into this again, we can actually right click here and we can say sort rows, let's say by ascending order. And we see that on almost every single dimension, these values are higher than these values. In other words, there's a group of people who seem to discriminate much more in how they select their videos and a group of people who discriminate a lot less. And that is in fact what defines our two different clusters. It's how discriminating they are, how much they care about these different issues when they determine what videos to watch. And then the last piece of all this, if we click over to data view and we scroll all the way to the right, we see we have two new columns of data. QCL underscore one and QCL underscore two. This is the cluster membership, meaning that this person in row one is placed into cluster one. This person in row five is placed into cluster two. So each of these will have a one or a two, or if you have more clusters in your algorithm, whatever that happens to be. And this is the distance to the cluster center. And the way to interpret this is that the smaller the value, the more representative that person is of that cluster, the closer they are to what's called the centroid, the middle of that cluster. And we can see this a little bit more cleanly if I sort this. So if I go up to data, sort cases, and I sort by both QCL1 and QCL2, it doesn't matter if it's ascending or descending, we see that for cluster one, this person, whoever this happens to be, this is person number 672, is the most representative of our cluster. He or she is right in the middle of that cluster or as close to the middle as anyone else is in that cluster. That's in contrast to, if we scroll down a bit, this person here, who's as far away from the cluster center as anyone is within that cluster. Now, they're still closer to being in cluster one than in cluster two, because that's how they were categorized, but they are the least typical person. And of course, there's everybody in between as well. And we could do the same thing for cluster two. This person is the most representative, the most central of the individuals in cluster two. And if we scroll to the bottom, we'd see the person who is least representative. So taking these two approaches, hierarchical cluster analysis to determine the number of clusters to use, and then k-means to actually do the clustering and interpret the results is a very powerful combination of tools to allow us to determine how groups of individuals or groups of whatever your data are, are similar to one another and also different from other groups. That's it for this video. I hope you found this useful. And if you have any questions, please comment below and I'll be sure to reply as quickly as I can. Aside from these tutorials, I'm on a mission to equip everyone with the information they need to thrive in our data-rich world. If you'd like to learn not just the mechanics of analysis, which these video tutorials focus on, but also learn the intuition behind the analysis you're performing, I strongly suggest you check out the other intuition-focused videos on this channel where I take the jargon out of statistics and data science and help you build a deep, intuitive understanding behind all the analysis that you're performing. I'll put a link below to a playlist of the videos that focus on just this. Finally, please take a moment to like the video, subscribe to this channel, and click that little bell icon so that you don't miss out on any new content that I put out. Thanks for watching.